Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be always acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. The first words God has placed in my mouth, from my heart, to say to you this morning, and by you I mean the five of you in the front row, Cindy and Harvey, Julie, Mary, and David. First words are, thank you. We are grateful for your courage, your vulnerability, your faithfulness, and your sacrifice. You have given your all to this process of discernment and study and formation. Heartfelt thanks to to your loved ones, your mentors and congregations, the leaders of this diocese, the Commission on Ministry, the Standing Committee, the Deacons Formation Team, for all that you have poured into these remarkable men and women and those coming up behind them. As a diocese, we have invested mightily in the diaconate, and you five have responded in kind with the first fruits of your lives and we give thanks to God for you. One of the great privileges of being a bishop is to receive quarterly letters from everyone in the ordination process, which gives me a glimpse of what it's like on the inside for all of those who are dedicating themselves to that particular season of study, prayer, practical learning, and reflection. Um, you know, it's actually too bad that we all don't have that assignment to write somebody every three months to tell them how we're doing. Seriously, it's an extraordinary act of reflection and integration. The five soon-to-be deacons have given me permission to share portions of their most recent letters. One of them wrote, years ago, when I was moved to deepen my relationship to God, it made all the difference that I found myself in the right church in the right season. And I want to encourage and support other people of faith or not yet faith whose lives can be blessed as we discover together what it means to live as the people of God. I believe my gifts can contribute to the work of a parish in forming God's people for ministry. So I have four things to say to you now, my dear friends in Christ and colleagues in ministry. I am persuaded that they are at the heart of your call and at the heart of what God needs and what we need from you as deacons. The first flows from your life in Christ and your life with Christ. Each of you speaks and write, writes freely of the profound experiences of love and grace that are at the foundation of your spiritual lives. One of you wrote, from the beginning of my discernment until today and now looking ahead, I have come to feel the close presence of our Lord God, a closeness that I now believe, hear this, that I now believe can never be shaken loose. And another of you wrote of your love for Christ in this way, the best and perhaps the most important result of this process is the enrichment and strengthening of my life of prayer, regular worship, instruction, reading material, and examples have made prayer a framework of my life. Love of Christ is the bedrock of that framework. It is one I would like to share in ministry. My first charge to you is precisely that to share the love you have received from Christ and have for him, and more than that, 
guide us, your fellow Episcopalians, into that kind of love relationship with Jesus as the bedrock of faith. And don't assume, do not assume, that we all have that love for ourselves and know it for ourselves. Don't assume that because sadly, many of us don't, or even when we do, it, it's fleeting. One of the great tragedies of our church, of the Episcopal Church, is that those who speak freely and confidently of a life-changing experience of God's love stands out so dramatically from the rest of us that we assume that such a call is immediately one for ordination. I'm not kidding. You prayed grace so beautifully. Have you considered becoming a priest or a deacon? You embody Jesus so beautifully. Have you considered ordination? I'm not doubting your call as deacons. I'm simply saying that that experience is the birthright of every child of God. And a relationship with Christ is the foundation of every Christian path. Now, I'm not saying that the rest of us don't have that, but collectively, it's a little tepid. Because practically speaking, in the way we live our lives, we are more often than not among what some call the um, practicing or the practical atheists. We believe in God, but we imagine everything is up to us. Our experiences of the Holy Spirit tend to be anemic because truth be told, we don't expect anymore to be touched by a love so deep, so wide, so broad that we can rest in it, be assured of God's unfailing, unconditional, compassionate love. So we need you to teach us about that love. We need to show it to us. We, we need you to help create environments and experiences in which others of us might be open to receive it. Faith, you know, is, is typically caught. It's not taught. Help us to be caught up in that faith. Because without it, it's kind of hard to justify everything else. My second charge to you flows now from your unique vocation as that bridge as some have called the diaconate, between local congregations and their surrounding communities, or as we sometimes say, as a bridge between the church and the world. And my charge is this, please, 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 do nothing of service to those outside of the church as a deacon on your own. Always bring one of us with you. Don't be the exemplary servant teach us as a church to serve. I cannot stress this enough. Your vocation is embedded, as you heard in the beginning of this service, it is embedded in our universal call as church to be Christ's hands, heart, feet in this world. And if you do all the work for us, you will get very, very, very tired. And we will take satisfaction in your ministry as if, in fact, it were ours. We must learn to do this together, and you are among those to teach us. One of you introduced me to the works and writings of Brian Stevenson, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative and tireless advocate for criminal justice reform, abolishment of the death penalty, and racial reconciliation. And one of Stevenson's key insights is that in order to solve the world's greatest problems, we must get proximate to them, close to them, and close to the people most adversely affected by them. And so if we want to address criminal justice reform, for example, we need to take Jesus' words in Matthew 25 seriously and actually visit people in prison and get to know them and their story. And remember, as Brian Stevenson says so beautifully, no one is completely defined 
by the worst thing we have ever done, not one of us. If we want to address climate change, we best spend time where people's lives are on the line because of changing climate and erratic weather patterns. If we want to address racial injustice, we need to forge real relationships across race and class. We need your help in this because as a church, we are really good at charity. We're really good at giving at arm's length and on our terms, and far less adept at the transformative relationships that can heal and transform and fuel us for the hard slog of justice. Don't do this work for us. Help us do this work. And my third charge, it's actually a subset of the second, as you begin imagining how your ministry will unfold in a given context in a particular parish, look around and identify at least the other Episcopal churches and preferably other faith communities in proximity and explore collaborative possibilities. I am persuaded that the future vitality of this diocese depends on all of us establishing new bonds between us, new pathways of partnerships. Um, most congregations imagine they're in it alone, and all the data would suggest that they're right until we change that. And the work is too big, frankly. The call is too overwhelming. We simply don't have scale on our own, and we never will. And if we don't learn to work together, in 20 years, only a few of our congregations are going to make it to the promised and preferred future God has for all of us to be robust and strong, compelling 21st century witnesses to the good news of Jesus. We need to do this together. The future of the Jesus movement is not in question. The future of our part in it as the Episcopal Church hangs in the balance. You are called and ordained to help us with this task. Now, my final word. My dear friends and colleagues in Christ, trust your call. Trust that God has called you, knowing full well all your strengths, all your vulnerabilities, all your gifts, all your struggles. Whenever you fall prey to that voice inside or the voices on the outside that would have you question God's call, think back on this moment, my word to you now. You're not called to be someone that you're not. You're not expected to be perfect. We're all gonna make mistakes together and we're gonna learn. God has called you to this. If you find yourself working too hard at this, ask yourself, you know, that age-old question, who is the savior of the world? Is it me? No. God has called you. Now, one of you wrote me this week, I've been reading and rereading the ordination vows, and at times the words feel overwhelming. Being a wholesome example to all people? <laughs> That's a tall order. I don't feel up to such a standard, but then I remember those words from Jeremiah, I am only a boy, and I calm down. Hear this, in the past, I used to question, who did I think I was thinking I was called? I tell myself now, who do I think I am not to respond to this persistent call that will not go away? I'm looking forward to living out my call and I will keep listening for God. Another one of you said, can I? Will I? These words seem to symbolize where the process began. I do. I will. They signify my commitment, and it's one I am eager to make. When I am... Um, first had the audacity to fill out the application form to be considered for bishop in the Diocese of Washington. I, um, I thought to myself, who do you think you are? 
little girl from Minneapolis. And I threw my hat in the ring and um, not expecting very much. And I, then I started to read the profile and, you know, the Diocese of Washington, as you know, is a very important diocese filled with very important people doing very important things. And they expected a great deal from their next very important bishop. And, um, but underneath all of that language, there was this humility and an acknowledgement that things weren't so well in all places in this very important diocese. And that one of the qualities in the profile was a person willing to grow with us. And I thought, well, I can do that. Grow with us. Grow into this work, slowly, step by step. And remember that God needs you. You as you are. I'm going to give you, each one of you, a whole stack of little business cards that has the Diocese of Washington on one side and uh, the prayer of St. Avila on the other. And I want you to um, keep it for yourself and then give it out to anyone whose paths you cross as a reminder of our call. Um, because it's a reminder of how Christ needs you and needs me. So I'll close by reading it for you and for all of us. Christ has no body here but ours, no hands and feet on earth but ours. Ours are the eyes through which he looks onto this world with kindness. Ours are the hands with which he works, ours the feet on which he moves, ours the voices with which he speaks to this world with kindness. Through our touch, our smile, our listening ear, embodied in us, Jesus is living here. So let us all go now, filled with the Spirit, into this world with kindness. Cindy, Harvey, Julie, Mary, David, thank you. And when you're ordained today, get out there and show us the way. Amen.